Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is James Jacob Prash from Morial Ministries, and I'm speaking to you on Genesis Christian TV and radio. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, looking today at the subject of victimhood and what the Word of God teaches ultimately about victimhood, that there is only one true victim. Look with me, please. To the book of Lamentations, Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 39. Lamentations is right after Jeremiah, chapter 3, verse 39. Why should any living mortal, human being, or any man offer complaint in view of his sins? Why should any man complain? in view of his sins. Jeremiah is writing his lament about the destruction of Jerusalem that took place in 585 BC. He's also prophesying to the longer term events of 70 AD, as Jeremiah was rejected and his message rejected, and Jerusalem and the first temple were destroyed on Tisha B'Av, roughly the 9th of August in the Jewish calendar. The same day of the year, Jerusalem would have seen its second temple destroyed after the rejection of Jesus. Jeremiah is called the lamb led to slaughter, much like Jesus is a lamb led to slaughter, Jeremiah being a type of Christ. So Jeremiah is speaking for his own time in the aftermath of the destruction of the first temple but he is also prophesying about the destruction of the second temple. And it is a very, very depressing book. It truly is. It's his lament. It is the most depressing book in Scripture, even more depressing than the book of Job. At least Job has a happy ending. Yet, in the midst of this very depressing book, we get two very encouraging passages, even in the depths of the most depressing circumstances imaginable. And we get two of our classic Christian hymns from it. Great is thy faithfulness, and the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, his mercy never comes to an end. They're new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Well, let's understand this. Mane emanata, mane emanata, shahar ha ira has de halashir, kol maxorai natata beshefa, mane emanata, ya imadi, great is thy faithfulness. Quite a book, Lamentations, and not one that people often read. It's read by Orthodox Jews on Tisha B'Av, Ritually, it's called a Megira Eha, literally the scroll of lamenting or the scroll of lamentations. But most Christians don't think much of it, therefore they ignore its prophetic value for the close of the age. Jeremiah is speaking of his own time, the first coming of Christ, as we've already talked about, but also the destruction coming at the close of the age. He's prophesying eschatologically. But in this particular verse that we read, why should any living mortal or any man offer complaint in view of his sins? I've had the blessing and privilege of being with Christians who've been persecuted for their faith in their own countries. One communist country I go to, I've known pastors, a number of them. Every one of them was arrested. Some of them were tortured dragged away from their families and put in prison for preaching Jesus, for being pastors. The local communist authorities would target the leadership. I've seen these men. I've met these men. They've not had an easy life. Yet none of them complains. They would say, Jesus said we're going to suffer. You'll have tribulation in the world. The world hated me. The world will hate you. A servant is not above his master. They would say that, but there's more to it than that. They realize the reality of sin. 
St. Paul had nothing to complain about. He was shipwrecked, he was flogged, he was left for dead, he was imprisoned, rejected, mistreated. But after what he did to believing Jews, once he ran with the foxes instead of riding with the hunters, he couldn't complain because he did the same thing to other Jewish believers at that time. Why should any mortal or any man offer complaint in view of his sins? How can any of us complain in view of our sins? I had a dear friend, Palm Sunday, two days ago, go to be with the Lord in Pennsylvania from coronavirus. He's someone who did not have an easy or a happy life. He had a wife who backslid and left him, took his children. Neither of them are walking with the Lord. His life was not a happy one or a prosperous one, but he stayed faithful to Jesus the whole time. And then he died at what otherwise would be a premature age due to the coronavirus not 48 hours ago. Not a happy life. Many believers have not had a happy life. They did not die happy. Many of them, however, were happy to die. Why is this? Now, we understand we have an enemy, Satan. He hates us and he persecutes the people of God, Israel, and the children of God, the true church. We know that. And we know that God allows tribulation to believers in order to bring correction into our lives, to deal with the things that are wrong with us as a father would correct the son or parent would correct their children. Those things are also true. But when life treats us really badly, we have to understand something. No matter how unfair life has been to us in this fallen world, it treated Jesus a lot worse. He had no sin. We did. One way or another, we all reap the repercussions of having been born into a fallen world, affirming the sins of Adam and Eve with our own actions, and needing to be born again, and then needing to have our old nature dealt with by the Lord as he prepares us for glory and eternity and the millennium. So it goes. Why should any living mortal or any man offer complaint in view of his sins? It's very easy to get into self-victimization, self-pity, and the things that go with it when life turns against us, when we've been mistreated, when we've been mistreated by other believers. I've certainly experienced that. Paul says, yes, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him. Right now, the, the terrible one with the Jezebel spirit who promoted heresy and attacked me for opposing it. She's suffering from a medically threatening condition that can result in septicemia, uh, a strangulated hiatus or a strangulated hernia popping through the abdominal wall. This could kill people. It can cause sepsis because it cuts off the blood supply to the abdominal region and put the body into septic failure. Well, this is, <laughs> I believe God's judgment does come upon people who act unrighteously towards others, towards backslidden and false believers who persecute the faithful church, those who would defend evil, those who would promote evil, knowing it's false. I've seen God's judgment come on them one after another. To me, it is a warning. Don't do it yourself, Jacob. You're no better and no different than they are. If you're not careful, the same can befall Jacob Prash. The same can befall Moriel. The same can befall any of us. None of us are the victims. We're the victims of our own sin. Today in the world, we have a political trend 
and a sociological trend stupidly called wokeness, wokeness. And it's gotten into the church. It has been advanced by people like Tim Keller, the Calvinist, and it draws on the influences of the old liberation theology that came from left-wing Roman Catholics like Sabino and Sabrino in Latin America in the late 1960s, and Desmond Tutu in South Africa in the Protestant version, where sin is defined as social injustice, not personal sin or immorality. It's social injustice that's seen as the sin. And someone's integrity and morality is judged by their reaction to social injustice, not by personal morality, as if the two were mutually exclusive. You're the victim. You're the victim. You're the victim. You have to be woken to injustice, to racism, and to sexism. Feminism is a classic example of this. But it gets into the church. When feminism gets into the church, Jezebel takes over and Ahab puts on a skirt. This has happened to so many ministries, so many pastors. The women rule the roost. They're out of control, and the men are in submission to the women. They are Ahabs. The world calls it henpecking. God calls it something much, much worse. The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, and they are fundamentally out of God's order. But it becomes a cancer within the church. I've seen it repeatedly, and it's happening now, more commonly. There are whole ministries based on Christian feminism that do and teach these absurd things. These women are scorned and angry, They make themselves the victim. Wokeness, you've got to be woken to it in the world. The plight of women in the world, you've got to be woken to it. Now it's gotten into the church. A racial redefinition of Christianity. Wokeness. This is Tim Keller. This is Stephen Sizer. This is Gary Burge, the pseudo-theologian from Wheaton College. They're teaching forms of wokeness, wokeness. It's in the world, but it's in the church. Let me begin with my own people. My family is a mixture of Irish Catholic. My mother was Irish Catholic and, 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 and Jewish. My wife and children are Israeli. Let me look at this now. I was brought up by my mother to resent Great Britain and the English. I was told about the Irish potato famine. I was told about the Easter uprising and the Black of Tans and what the English did to the Irish, which equated to what the Protestants did to the Catholics. It took on a religious dimension. It was a victim. We are the victim. The Irish Republican Army, which is not even the true Irish Republican Army today, the provisional IRA is not the traditional one, not the historical one, essentially engaged in acts of terror like they did in Omar, killing a four-year-old child. Unspeakable things in Belfast, they even killed other Catholics. Out of control recklessness, but that becomes justified because of a victim mentality. The wokeness, the wokeness, what was done to the Irish? Well, that's one side of the coin. Let me look at the other side of the coin that I wasn't told. The founders of Irish Republicanism and Irish independence were not Roman Catholic. That came later with someone called Daniel O'Connor and other people like this. No, the founders of Irish republicanism, which began as a home rule movement, was Isaac Butt, was someone called Napper Tandy. It was someone called Charles Parnell. It was the author and clergyman, Protestant, Jonathan Swift. 
these were the Irish Republicans' founders. They were the founders of what became Republicanism. Wolf Tone, Napper Tandy, Jonathan Swift, Charles Parnell, not a Roman Catholic among them. I wasn't ever told that. The Unionist Protestants of Northern Ireland don't want to face the fact that Irish Republicanism was found by Protestants, and that Protestants in Ireland fought the British crown in the 1790s. They only want to talk about William of Orange in 1690, not what happened 100 years later when the Protestants fought the British crown for Irish independence. This is called revisionism. You rewrite history and selectively delete the bits that are uncomfortable for you. What the black and tans did and the potato famine and all these kinds of things, and that's true. It's true. It is also true that afterwards there was an Irish civil war between the followers of my fellow New Yorker, uh, Eamon de Valera, and Michael Collins, the first general, actually, of, of the IRA when it was a partisan militia, not a terrorist organization, as the real IRA was not what the provisional IRA is. Well, they had a civil war. I was never told about the Irish Civil War and the plenty potent division that happened in Ireland. What the Irish Catholic nationalists did to each other, the bloodbath was far worse, far worse than what the black and tans, the British, did to the Irish. Far worse. But I wasn't told about that. I was only told about the victim mentality. The Irish are the victims. What they did to each other doesn't matter. The Protestants the same. They just want to talk about William of Orange, who was from Holland, fighting King James in 1690. They don't want to tell you that 100 years later, the Protestants rose up against the English establishment. They don't want to talk about that. They want to be the victim. Jews? Who killed the most Jews in a single day? Who murdered the most Jews in a single day? Who holds the record for killing the most Jews in one day? Was it Adolf Hitler? No. Was it Adolf Eichmann? No. Was it Heinrich Himmler? No. It wasn't the Nazis at all. Who killed the most Jews in a single day? I'm reading from 2 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 17. And Abiyah and his people defeated them with a great slaughter, so that 500,000, a half million chosen of Israel, fell slain. Can you imagine at that time what proportion of the Jewish population a half million men was? They weren't killed by the Philistines or the Amalekites. They were killed by other Hebrews. And the men of Israel were the villains. It was the followers of Abiyah who were the protagonists who remained faithful to God. Hitler's Nazis murdered 1.5 million Jewish children. 1.5 million. With non-therapeutic abortion? The Jewish state reborn out of the Holocaust, modern Israel, has killed over 2 million Jewish children. Who holds the record for murdering the most Jewish children? The Nazis? No. They come in a poor second. The modern state of Israel holds the record for murdering the most Jewish children. Oh, that's women's rights. Well, that's women's wrongs. 
completely against the maternal instinct that God placed in women to kill their own baby. Demonized society? It's a society that thinks killing its own unborn for no clinical reason is justified. Is it any more sick than those yelling, Heil Hitler? No, it isn't. No! The Holocaust should not be forgotten. Anti-Semitism is growing once again and will continue to, culminating with the Antichrist. But the Antichrist is going to make a covenant with backslidden Israel who's rejected Yeshua, Jesus, as their Messiah. They're going to enable him before he turns on them. Look what they're doing already. The abortion rate in Israel may be the highest in the developed world. But they're the victim. They are the victim. I'd like to talk about the victimization of black people. The crimes perpetrated against people who are African and of African descent. You want to see a bloodbath? You want to see inexplicable cruelty, violence, oppression, mass murder, Holocaust, genocide? Look at what happened in Rwanda. Look at what happened in Burundi. Look at what happened between the Hutu and Tutsi tribes. Look at what happened in Uganda under Idi Amin or in the Central African Republic. And look at modern South Africa, post-apartheid. Black unemployment has more than doubled. Underemployment is incalculable. Infant mortality is much worse than it was under apartheid. Everything for the average black person is worse off now in terms of economically and in terms of longevity, life expectancy, longevity, infant mortality. Now, I was against the apartheid. I considered it to be racist and unjust. But as Desmond Tutu, Desmond Tutu admitted what the ANC has done Had the apartheid government done it, he would have expected it. South Africa is a nation that has exchanged one evil for another. That's all. Why? Wake up! We're the victim! Yeah, but you're the victim of your own actions. You can always blame what other people did to you. Israel cannot blame the Nazis for its contemporary abortion rate, they've outkilled the Nazis. The Irish cannot blame the British for the Irish Civil War. They outkilled the British. Black Africans cannot blame European colonialists for the genocide that's overtaken one country in Africa after another in the post-colonial era. They can't blame them anymore. the first country in the so-called New World to be a black country that had total independence long before the British Commonwealth countries of the Caribbean was Haiti, since the 1700s. Do you want to see the oppression of blacks? Do you want to see unbelievable corruption and oppression of blacks? Go to Haiti. The voodoo, Papa Doc, one corrupt government after another. You wouldn't believe it. Talk to missionaries who served the Lord in Haiti. I have wokenness. Nobody wants to be woken unto that. Nobody. The social justice warriors don't want to talk about the fact that post-colonial Africa has left the average black person worse off than he was under the British or French. They don't want to talk about that, and I don't believe in colonialism. As an American, my family, American, Irish, and, and, and Israeli, 
all three fought the British for their independence. I don't believe in colonialism. But I can't deny the facts. Oh, what was done? What was done? What was done in the Boxer Rebellion by the British and the Europeans to the Chinese when they took Hong Kong and they had the Boxer and Opium Wars in Canton and Guangzhou? <laughs> yeah, that's true. But Mao killed 40 million Chinese. 40 million. He didn't even come close. to the Europeans or British. After the Americans and Australians left Vietnam and Southeast Asia, I've been to the killing fields of Cambodia, of Kampuchea. Towers, towers of human skulls. Pol Pot killed well over two million of his own people, holding parents at gunpoint with machine guns well, I took their infant children and bashed their brains out against a tree on front of the parents and made them watch it before they killed the parents. Towers of human skulls. This was not white against yellow. This was yellow against yellow. Rwanda was black against black. Ireland, white against white. Yugoslavia is even worse. Caucasian against Caucasian. And Northern Ireland, they even do it in the name of Christianity. They murder people because of what church they go to. But they're the victim. They're the victim. Black America cannot blame the white establishment for the fact that three out of four black children are born out of wedlock. And the highest percentage of babies aborted in the United States are black. They're culling the black population. They're victims of their own sin. They don't want to talk about that. They just want to talk about the injustice perpetrated against them. They don't want to talk about what they do to themselves. The murder rate in Chicago, black on black violence. They don't want to talk about that. For every black that's shot by a police officer, even justifiable shootings. 58 blacks in the United States are murdered by other blacks for every black shot by a cop. That includes black policemen. No, wokeness only wants you to be the victim, not the victim of your own actions. I have always looked with a sense of shame and disgust upon what was done to the Indians in the United States. The Walk of Tears by Andrew Jackson, the deportation of the Creek Indians and Seminoles to, to Oklahoma made them walk, children dying on the way of starvation, God knows what else. What was done with the reservation system, what was done to the Sioux, Chickawa, Black, Blackfoot, Crow, Apache, Chiricahuas, Then I found out something. Pre-Columbian history. The name of the Sioux was not Sioux. Sioux was a Native American name for invader. The Sioux were called the Lakota. They came from the Midwest, mainly Minnesota, and they invaded the Dakotas and Montana. The other Indians called them invaders. The tribe on tribe warfare, the tribalism, the scalping, before the Europeans came, the white Europeans, the Indians were busy massacring each other. We're told this myth of the noble savage. It goes back actually to the 19th century and it has very ancient roots in the writing of Tacitus in ancient Rome, that these primordial indigenous people were not yet corrupted 
by civilization or by any Western civilization. They were the noble savage. They were not noble. Yes, it's terrible what happened to the Polynesians. The Pakia, when the white people came to New Zealand. What happened to the Maori? But the Maori doesn't like to talk about what happened to the real indigenous New Zealands, the Maori. They were exterminated by the Maori and they literally ate them cannibalistically. In Hawaii, there was human sacrifice of babies thrown into volcanoes to appease Pele, the volcanic god. Oh, I know about the injustices. I know about what people did to the Polynesians, and it's wrong, it's a shame, it's a disgrace. But I also know what the Polynesians did to each other and to themselves. What was done to blacks? It was wrong, it was a shame and a disgrace. But not nearly as bad as what they did to each other. I've been to Tanzania, I've been to Kenya, I've been to Zimbabwe. You wouldn't believe what Mugabe did. He took a rich country and raped it and turned it into a poor one. Uganda, the same, unbelievable what Idi Amin did. The Central African Republic, the same. What happened in Liberia, the same. Sierra Leone, the same. Zaire, the Congo, the same. If Europeans didn't come back with their military to put down the intertribal conflict, there would have been even more genocide. They tell you half the story. The Jews are the victims. Well, yeah, they are. But they're also the victims of their own sin. The Irish are the victims, don't they are? But they're also the victims of their own sin. The Africans are the victim. Oh, they are? They're the victim of their own sin. The Native Americans are the victim. Yes, they are. They're also the victims of their own sin. The Polynesians are the victims. The yellow man of Southeast Asia, the Chinese are the victims. What other people did to them. Everybody's happy to talk about but nobody wants to talk about what they did to each other, what they did to themselves. This is hypocrisy. It's better to retreat into revisionism and the myth of the noble savage. Oh, feminism, what was done to women, the injustices? Well, there were. Not having equal pay for equal jobs, there were. But consistently since the 1970s, work-related stress disorders, neurological diseases, clinical depression, cardiovascular disease have increased astronomically as well as all matter of gynecological disorders and infertility since women's lead. Violent crime among women has increased twice as much as it has among men. Now, I understand there was injustices against women that needed to be corrected. But the early suffragettes like Susan B. Anthony, they weren't like what you have now. The victims of feminism are ultimately women themselves, at least those women who subscribe to it. No! Everybody thinks they're the victim. We think we're the victim. I think I'm a victim. You think you're a victim. When I'm mistreated, we're all victims. We are all victims. Why should any living mortal or any man offer complaint in view of his own sins. I know about social sin. There are over 300 verses in scripture that speak of social injustice. 
it was a major theme of some of the Hebrew prophets, such as Amos. It was a major theme of the Apostle James in the New Testament. These injustices even getting into the church among Christians or among the Hebrew people of God who were not supposed to have these injustices, but did. Nonetheless, that's the reality. Everybody wants to blame someone else for what they are and what happened to them. No, I don't say that Christians should be indifferent to injustice. The slavery abolition of the United States was born out of Northern evangelicism. That's what founded the abolitionist movement, saved Christians. Originally in the American South, it was the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. If you look at the people before, Martin, even before Martin Luther King, people like Medgar Evers, Booker T. Washington, the, the great food scientist, George Washington Carver, going back to Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, these people were devout Bible-believing Christians. They understood it was useless to fight social immorality unless they first dealt with their own sin. Harriet Tubman was a saved Christian. Booker T. Washington was a saved Christian. Now, sin is purely wokeness, injustice, racism. What people do to themselves and have done to themselves in Asia, Europe, Africa, Caucasian, black, yellow, Hispanic, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Native Americans are the same. What happened in Cuba was the same. What happened in Venezuela is the same. Blame somebody else. Well, the somebody else may be guilty. They probably are. But not as guilty as you are. Not as guilty as I am. No, friends. It doesn't work that way. In Romans chapter 3, we read the following in verse 23. For all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. Hamartino hamartenu, in Hebrew, heten pesha, we all miss the mark. We all fail to live up to his standards. We're all victims, victims of our own sin. Apart from Satan, we cannot blame anybody but ourselves. Blame other people. <laughs> Even the world knew this. I think of uh, George Orwell in his book, Animal Farm. So you have a revolution and you depose the establishment and you get a new establishment that's worse than the old one. Like the British rock band, The Who. We won't get fooled again, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Even the world knows the reality of it. But people don't want to face the reality of it. They'd rather be delusional. They'd rather pursue a non-existent ideal. Sing Imagine by John Lennon. He wrote a number of catchy melodies, but lyrically, that one is completely idiotic. Imagine no possessions. He lived in the Dakota. He lived in Ascot or Weybridge. He had mansions near where I live in England, when I'm in England. I lived in Manhattan. I remember he lived in the Dakota. I saw him there. I gave him the Chronicles of Narnia. You know what the Dakota is? How palatial? Imagine no possessions. Maybe you and I can, but he couldn't. 
It's all nonsense. It is all nonsense. Yeah, we're all victims. Victims of Satan and victims of ourselves. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. If everybody's a victim, nobody's a victim. Nobody but one. There's only ever been one true victim. No matter how miserable life treats us, we reap the repercussions of our own sin. Now, there is persecution of the people of God, and he will avenge them. We see this in Revelation chapter 6 and the book of Zechariah chapter 5. God will avenge those who persecute his people and his children because they are his. That is something somewhat separate. Although related, God allows it for a purpose. But the church is the body of Christ. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? When Christians are persecuted, we're not being persecuted. Jesus is. We just have the honor and privilege of being members of his body. We're not being persecuted. He is. We're not being rejected and cursed. He is. He's the only victim. No man has a right to complain because of his sin. No woman has the right to complain because of her sin. None of us have a right to complain because of our sin. Only one victim. He who knew no sin became sin to give us salvation. Only one true victim. And he didn't complain about it. For your sake and for mine, he accepted it. He who knew no sin became sin. Thank God for Jesus, the lamb that was slain. To our Jewish friends, Hag Pesach Sameach, happy Passover. Jesus, Yeshua, is the Paschal Lamb of God. Mm-hmm.